Welcome to today's class. Last week we stopped uh, with our discussion of central banks, supranational banks, uh, and now after this uh, uh, slight trip and uh, short trip to central banking and uh, economics, we return to business and uh, the business models and income sources of banks, to be more precise. Um, and in this part, I want to show you how banks can actually earn a buck, how uh, they can uh, earn a profit, uh, and we'll divide our discussion into the two main areas in which banks can uh, generate profits, that is, and generate revenues, first of all, um, that is commercial banking and investment banking. Uh, today, we'll probably just talk about um, commercial banking, uh, and again, there are two sides to commercial banking. First of all, deposit taking, which is not really meant to generate profits, but it's meant uh, to generate uh, a hopefully cheap source of financing for banks um, and attract customers. And then you might be able to uh, give out loans and via cross-selling, um, you can maybe even convert a depositor uh, to a loan applicant. And this is the commercial banking side of banking business. We'll start with a very basic discussion of savings, because this is the uh, ultimate uh, motive for depositors to go to a bank uh, and to give financing to a bank, because people want to save some of their uh, income. And that's why we talk about bank balances, bank deposits, or uh, especially in theoretical works, we just simply speak of deposits. Um, savings are the part of the available income of households that is not con used for consumption purposes. Um, and that is why deposits, saving, and banking in general is closely related to household finance, but also to macro and microeconomics. This is where it becomes uh, it, it business and business administration and management research turns into economics because at this point, um, if you want to do and if you want to look at this uh, from a more theoretical point of view, um, you can start by looking through the lens of microeconomics at why are households saving money, uh, why are they giving their money to banks, what could go wrong, uh, and so on. Then the savings rate. Uh, of a household is simply the percentage of the available income that is not used for consumption. And if you look at data on uh, savings rates, you can see uh, a huge time variation um, also across countries. And we'll have a slide on that uh, in a couple of moments. But it's quite clear that savings rates will change over time and it will change from country to country, uh, depending on several uh, factors, actually. Now, the goal of the household is usually uh, to achieve an intertemporal consumption smoothing. That is, um, you have enough money, but you also want to be able to consume more in the future. That is why you uh, push some of your household income into the future. You want to earn a slight return, but in many cases, you don't want to risk, um, you don't want to invest in risky asset, but you just want to smooth your um, consumption over time. And this, um, leads, this leads to intertemporal consumption <coughs> smoothing, um, also depending on the household's risk aversion. Usually, when we talk of saving, of course, we want um, the uh, change in consumption uh, to be enabled risk-free. Uh, now, what is saving? It's the limitation of present consumption to increase future consumption. Um, it should be clear why we save at all. We want to be able to um, consume more in the future. Um, we want to secure the necessities of life in the future. And at this point, it becomes quite clear that um, theoretically, uh, saving, deposit taking is closely related uh, to life insurance. Um, if you look at uh, deposit taking uh, in a very long term, um, at a very long term horizon, uh, at some point, theoretically, it is equal to life insurance. Because what is the bank doing? The bank accepts deposits, it acts as um, 
Oh, what is the English word? German, it's Treuhänder. Um, it's not caretaker, but oh, I've forgotten the name, the English vocabulary. I have to look it up, sorry. Um, anyway, um, the bank um, guarantees the safety of the deposits, uh, possibly together with a deposit insurance fund, but the money is, the capital is not invested in a risky asset. And in this way, it, resem it closely resembles life insurance, life insurance products that are also intended to be risk-free or virtually risk-free. Why? Because people want um, to secure uh, retirement with it. Yeah? I'm just confused about the analogy because life insurance pays out after you die. Okay. No, no, that's one, one part of life insurance. Um, life insurance and the majority of life insurance is actually uh, usually an annuity that is paid out after you retire. So in the basic form of life insurance, you save money now and you are guaranteed a, usually a lump sum that is paid out at retirement. In some cases, you are paid out an annuity. Uh, so that is actually like, like a salary, um, like um, your, your pension payment that is paid out monthly. And in many cases, um, you have um, a life insurance um, that only pays out if you die. And sometimes you have a combined life insurance that pays out, for example, a lump sum of, say, 500,000 at retirement, or 1 million maybe, or 500,000 if you die before. So life, but again, uh, usually the scenario in which um, uh, the lump sum is only paid out if you die before retirement, um, this scenario, this type of life insurance is actually has a very small portion uh, in the market. Usually life insurance is, um, is close to uh, a pension fund. Mm -hmm. That is also why, for example, in Germany, pension funds and life insur and insurance companies are supervised under the same directorate at BaFin. That is also why life insurance is, um, again, in this scenario, quite, clo quite closely related to, to a deposit taken by a bank. And this is also why life insurance is such a such a big business and b a very vital part of the financial system because if insurance life insurance fail, many people are looking at uh, uh, the problem that they will not get any payments um, in, after retiring. Yeah. And this this is the same scenario, the same setting. Yeah. Uh, obviously, usually banks have a much shorter investment horizon with their deposits uh, than a life insurance company. A life insurance policy will run, say, 30 or even 40 years. Uh, the deposits have a short-term maturity, but they are usually left with the bank for a couple of years. But still, um, life insurance is obviously much more long-term. Long okay. What is the economic meaning of saving? Uh, saving creates capital and it can therefore boost production. However, uh, of course, too much saving is also counterproductive uh, for, a, for an economy. And saving is also an important insurance uh, instrument to prevent social uh, decline um, and welfare loss. Uh, humans have a tendency to consume too much uh, too soon. Uh, and that is why people uh, intuitively and naturally save too little. They do not save enough money uh, for um, their own age and for retirement. And that is why you have certain systems in place as a state uh, to guarantee that everyone gets uh, a pension when they retire and that everyone has enough money to live from and to live off when they retire. Why do most countries have social security uh, for uh, people uh, and for retirement systems? Because if people save too little uh, and do not prepare for retirement, the state, the government has two options. Let people starve in the streets 
or pay uh, transfers uh, and make transfer payments uh, to elderly people who haven't saved enough money for retirement. So both scenarios are worse, usually considered worse, than just forcing people before this happens to save for retirement. And that is why we have social, social security systems here when it comes to retirement. And usually saving uh, also prevents this from happening. This is the savings rate of German households in percent uh, from the German Statistical um, Federal Office um, between 91 and 2017. Um, now, what can you see? A very simple observation from basic macroeconomics. What would you suspect? And why do savings rates change over time? Yeah? It went down, yeah. Yes. Yes. It went down um, until 2000, uh, 2001. It increased until the financial crisis and went down again. Why? The observation is correct, but what is the, what is the explanation for that? You could simply, s yeah? Interest Yeah. Could simply flip it uh, and call it an interest rate. And it's quite it's obvious that uh, the savings rate is closely related to the general level of interest rates. To the general level of interest rates, because after reunification, um, and at that point, interest rates were quite high because the German state had to finance reunification. After that. Uh, interest rates decreased up until 2000, 2001. After that, um, we saw uh, a boost in economic growth. Uh, we saw an increase in interest rates. It then, at some point, interest rates decreased again. We had the financial crisis. Interest rates were lowered even more. And then, since then, the savings rate has remained approximately at this level, you know, at say eight, nine, or 10%. So interest rates are important determinant of um, the changes in the savings rates we can observe in households. There are obviously other factors that also influence the savings rate, uh, but here from this simple statistics, you can simply infer that it has to be the general level of interest rates that drives this. Now, these are the same saving rates of private households in France, Switzerland, Germany, UK, Canada, and USA. Uh, again, you can see that for these five years, uh, savings rates have changed over time. But why are the savings rates different for different countries? I think we have it on the next slide. Yeah, what can the how can the differences uh, be explained between these different countries? Well, yeah. Cultures yeah, and it's a different. It can. It could be due to a different culture in consumption. Um, mm, yes. But even more importantly, a different culture, not in consumption, but in, yeah, saving. But even, I would say one important difference is that, um, especially in the USA, and I guess it's true for Canada as well, uh, people in these states have a different culture of investing. Um, people in the US tend to invest much more into stocks rather than risk-free uh, deposits uh, with banks. Uh, and instead of saving money, they usually invest in stocks. They have much more confidence in stock markets than they have in, in Europe. So this could be the explanation for the huge difference between Canada, USA, and even UK, and uh, Swan, uh, France, Switzerland, and Germany. And that, of course, could also be caused by what? 
for Switzerland, it's quite clear. Switzerland has a, is, is, in these countries, I would guess, probably has the highest per capita income. So people in Switzerland are disproportionately rich and richer than people, for example, in, in France and Germany and the UK. So I would guess that people in Switzerland do not need to save too much money uh, in contrast to France. Then it could also be due to uh, the existence of uh, social security systems. If, for example, you know that you have unemployment, social unemployment um, insurance, if you know that uh, you have uh, full coverage uh, when it comes to um, pensions um, and uh, if you have health insurance, you do not, you, you, you uh, on average, I would guess you would not need to save too much money for these cases than you would, for example, in the US. Still, people in the US save much less than, say, in France and Germany. And last but not least, it could also be that people on average just have much less money, that the income per capita is lower. Okay, so this, this might also drive these differences and there are several studies that look at savings rates across time and across um, countries. But needless to say, uh, people use banks differently and they use deposits differently. Um, now. What follows now is um, closely based on what is offered by German banks. Um, in Germany, we have more or less three types of uh, bank deposits. We have demand deposits. Those are overnight deposits on current accounts. They can be withdrawn immediately. We have fixed term deposits. Those are deposits with a fixed duration. Uh, these are called time deposits or with a specific notice periods. Period. Those are deposits at notice, for example, a three month um, notice. And last but not least, we have saving deposits. Those are accounts with money with unlimited duration, and you have a notice period of at least three months, and you are issued a certificate, what we call in German Sparbuch. Uh, traditionally, a Sparbuch, such a certificate, uh, was uh, a little book where each transaction was uh, was written into. Nowadays you have uh, a bank card, but I still actually I still have one of these certificates, one of these Sparbuchs uh, back from the days when I was a student, and I still have I think ten euro cents on that. And. Yeah. When I retire, I, I'm intending to cash in. It's also very funny. If you, one would think that you probably know that in, um, um, uh, oh, perpetual annuity is doesn't the limit of a of a perpetual annuity is not infinity. Uh, and if you maybe one of you has uh, seen one of the first uh, episodes of Futurama and in Futurama the main character has a small bank I think he has a small bank account and he's, he skips 1000 years into the future goes to the bank and then he has a couple of billion dollars on his bank account and spends it all I think on a on a can of uh, anchovy you know, because they are extinct maybe 30 years, even with a thousand years, it will not work that way, but uh, I'm, 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 I'm intending on cashing in my, my uh, saving certificate in the future, a couple of decades. Yeah. Um, these are the three main types of deposits you will find at a German bank. One has to, one has to see that um, the names for those products will differ from bank to bank. But those are the three main types. Unlimited maturity and unlimited uh, excess uh, with overnight deposits, uh, demand deposits. You can demand it to be repaid at any time. You have time deposits. Uh, that's usually what we, um, some, uh, some, uh, some cultural background uh, in German, uh, the word for this is Festgeld. Uh, and Festgeld uh, is uh, something 
uh, we sometimes um, uh, we have a connotation uh, and it's um, related to, to Bayern Munich, uh, the football club, because uh, usually um, when they when they haven't bought uh, too many players uh, and they intend to buying up the market, uh, they usually will say to the press, uh, our 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 time deposit account is uh, running full uh, and has a lot of money in it, and uh, they will also always refer to their Festgeld conto. Mm. They have a huge Festgeld conto. <laughs> because usually so, uh, football clubs will not invest in risky assets. Mm. Okay. And saving deposits. And those are the uh, famous Sparbücher in German. Okay. Uh, why do we have a, such a variety of deposit products? Um, customers want to be able to choose from such a variety uh, of products because they are also interested in a range of interest rates. Under normal circumstances with non-zero interest rates, you would see that obviously overnight demand deposits offer maybe 1% and if you agree to a time deposit with say a two year or a five year maturity, you might be able to get three or four percent interest rate. And on a Sparbuch, on a, on a saving deposit um, with a three month notice, you might get 1.5 percent. So depending on uh, your investment horizon, uh, you would get, and in, in normal, under normal circumstances, you would get different interest rates for the different types of deposits. Now, nowadays, you will be lucky to get 0.1% on any of these deposit types. That is also why most of these products have temporarily vanished and banks usually do not offer all these products anymore because no one is, 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 is running to banks uh, uh, with their deposits and with zero interest rates. There's no need uh, to deposit your bank um, with a commercial bank. Now, products that limit the scope of actions as little as possible are preferred by the banks. That's quite clear. And you have a large interest in the field of long-term deposits because these pose a low liquidity risk for the banks. Because if you look at demand deposits, it's a very fragile source of financing. It can be demanded by, and repayment can be demanded by customers at any time, and thus financing can be withdrawn from banks at any time. So you have a high liquidity risk, and if you offer long-term deposit uh, products, you can limit this liquidity risk and this maturity mismatch. Now, what are the characteristics of an investment opportunity? You have risk-free savings and risk-free deposits. They serve as external financing for the bank. Investments in the bank's equity serve Oh, yeah, they serve as self-financing for the bank. You sometimes also have hybrid securities, uh, which show features of external and internal financing. And external financing is, to a large part, based on deposits and, to some extent, on loans uh, from the interbank, on the interbank market or with the central bank. Now, again, deposits are a major source of financing. Banks will not earn uh, profits from offering deposit products, but they are able to finance their lending activities and uh, they can use deposit products for cross-selling. Because if you have a customer that has come to you with uh, his or her deposits, you can try to sell him or her a loan or other financial products uh, at a different point in time. Demand deposits. I think this is quite clear now. Um, the purpose is you want to handle cashless payment transactions. It's a credit balance in the check or business account. You have overnight deposits uh, and you can use it as a disposition mass. This is as a bar buffer to cover unexpected payments in the short term. Usually you will not get any interest payments on this, especially not with the zero, uh, during zero interest um, times. Um, and this is the price of permanent availability. Interest rates vary, and there are some banks who still offer a non-zero interest rate, but one has to be clear, uh, these banks are only offering a slightly positive interest rate in order to attract customers. That's the only reason. 
And every time you see, Germany is famous for offering bank accounts for free. Uh, and this is quite different from many other countries where you have to pay for financial services and for account services. In Germany, uh, traditionally, uh, because competition was so uh, stiff and um, uh, we had so much competition in the banking system, uh, bank accounts used to be for free for everyone. And banks were able to earn their profits simply by um, maturity transformation by having uh, interest rates in the five six percent um, and by giving out loans now this doesn't work any longer and this is why banks are increasing their fees on bank accounts if you nowadays see a bank that is still offering a free bank account you can be sure that the bank will try to cross sell any other products and you will get a lot of mail after signing up for that bank account hmm? Fixed term deposits, um, those are deposits with a fixed duration or with an agreement on a certain period of notice. Condition usually is that you have a minimum investment amount, for example, 5,000, 1,000 euros. Um, and for private customers, it's an alternative to a savings deposits. You can restructure your portfolio, but I would guess that nowadays no one would use this type of investment because it doesn't yield any 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 interest rates right now corporate clients and banks um, they also use this type um, as an interest bearing investment uh, for liquidity surpluses this is why for example football clubs are using these types of deposits because if they have some millions uh, they can put aside uh, they can just invest it in a at a fixed uh, period they usually will invest it uh, for risk in a risk-free asset. Why? Because uh, football clubs uh, are not profit-oriented, uh, and they will not be allowed to uh, invest in stocks, for example. So they will use bank accounts and deposit accounts. And the interest rate depends on the current market interest rate, the duration, and the amount of the deposit. Usually, those are. Here, um, those are the effective interest rates uh, and investment volumes in total for deposits with um, agreed duration up to two years and over two years. Uh, those, are the data. This is, those are data from the Deutsche Bundesbank. And you can see that interest rates, average interest rates have decreased between 2000 and, uh, 2014 to 2015 from 0.79 to 0.65%. And again, also the volume has decreased because no one is willing to invest here in such uh, um, um, low paying uh, investment asset. And for the uh, investments over two years, it looks the same when it comes to the trend, obviously, because the maturity is higher um, and longer, the interest rate is higher, slightly higher. Mm -hmm. And if you look at data from 2017, 2018, interest rates will be even lower. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's quite clear. Again, the general level, general level of interest rates. Um, something a little bit different and not related to the German banking sector, something that is known from the US sector and the US banking sector. Uh, those are money market papers. Money market papers are tradable on an exchange and uh, they are called certificates of deposits or CDs or simply money market papers. These are marketable receipts for deposits and these are fixed term deposits and because they are standardized, they become marketable and tradable for institutional and also retail investors. Um, they have a standardized duration and a standardized volume. Otherwise, obviously, they would not be able uh, to be tradable. They would not be tradable on an exchange. And they have a fixed or variable return. If they have a variable rate, uh, it's called a floating rate CD. And Certificates of deposits are quite common. If you ever walk uh, by a bank branch in the US, you might you will might be able to see an ad uh, in the showcase of the bank saying our CD rate is 1.5%. One year CD rate is 1.7%. And banks will advertise with their CD rates 
and these certificates of deposits are tradable in contrast to the deposits we know from Germany. This is something that is not possible in Germany. Some other examples are commercial papers or treasury bills. Treasury bills are obviously issued by the treasury, or more precisely the government. T-bills and commercial papers, uh, this is the same um, for paper and the same type of deposit, but these are issued by companies. That's why they are called commercial papers. Main centers of trading uh, are London and New York. And to give you an idea of what this looks like, this is an actual uh, ad by Reliance Bank. I have no idea in which state and city this is, uh, but it's, uh, you can look it up. I guess it is St. Louis because it's, it has Reliance Bank SDL at the end. Uh, and here you can see the um, certific certificate of deposits, the CD rates, 0.6% uh, for 11 months, 1.25, 1.6, and 1.99%. And this is the annual percentage yield, is accurate and applies to the initial term of the CD. Available for consumer and commercial accounts, no public funds, minimum balance required to open is $1,000. And this is how banks advertise their CD rates in the US. Okay. Savings deposits. Um, again, this is uh, specific to Germany. Uh, we used to have Sparbücher, savings books and uh, savings certificates. These are being more and more replaced by savings cards and you can actually use ATM machines um, to withdraw money. Um, and this word Spareinlage, savings deposit, uh, was a legally, a legally protected term until 93, and no one else except the Sparkassen uh, were allowed to use this word. And this is the, the legal uh, bit, and it's regulated in paragraph 21 of the Verordnung über die Rechnungslegung der Kreditinstitute is the executive order concerning the accounting of banks. Uh, you might remember that in Germany we also distinguish between laws and so-called Verordnung. Law is Gesetz. Verordnung is an executive order by a ministry uh, or by, an, uh, by any other branch of the uh, executive. Um, and this is an executive order. Um, because it regulates the accounting rules for banks and it clarifies the accounting at, bank in, at banks. Uh, and here it is stated that savings deposits are open-ended funds that fulfill the following conditions. They are marked as a savings deposit by drawing up a certificate, a savings book, Sparbuch. They are not intended for payment transactions, so you cannot pay with your uh, savings card. Uh, and your, the card, the um, electronic card of your savings account um, in any store, for example. Um, they have a notice period of at least three months and they are not intended for corporations, limited companies, cooperatives, economic associations, partnerships and companies located abroad having a comparable legal form. Meaning it's solely restricted to private persons, retail customers, and charitable, benevolent, ecclesiastical partnerships uh, and cooperatives. In some cases, uh, even uh, associations, German Vereine, uh, they can open a savings account and savings deposit account. Uh, but you can see this is a type of deposit that is restricted to private persons and to charitable uh, organizations. In Germany, we usually have uh, savings deposits with a three month notice period. Um, and we have some incentives and some uh, specialized products um, that give customers uh, incentives to um, open such a savings account. Uh, for example, Wachstum sparen, that is growth saving. Prämien sparen, premium saving, uh, Ziel sparen, target saving, 
extra saving, a bonus saving. Uh, also, at some point, we had a, a product by some Sparkassen uh, that was called uh, DAX Sparbuch. Um, and one would think that this is uh, a more risky product. Well, it's not really. It's still a risk-free savings account that falls under the deposit insurance uh, system in Germany. The only difference is that usually uh, the bank will offer you an interest rate that is to some extent linked to uh, some goals or linked to, for example, the DAX stock index. DAX Sparbücher, for example, those are savings deposits in which you will get, say, 1% plus maybe an additional 0.2% interest rate in case the DAX, the DAX stock exchange, uh, the DAX stock index performs extraordinarily well. Here with growth saving, you will probably get 0.5% if you don't withdraw any money in the first year, 0.5%, 0.6% in the second year and so on. So you will get some bonus uh, and you have a small incentive to leave the money with the bank, but this is only possible via a small change to interest rates. And I can still remember this because during the financial crisis, um, there was a discussion uh, in a German, um, a German political uh, TV show, uh, and people could call into the show and they could uh, post their questions and someone uh, asked the question, someone from the audience asked the question, is my DAX savings deposit still safe? And obviously uh, in, the, in the, um, the guests of the show, two of them had a different opinion on that. Uh, the first opinion was, well, of course it's safe, it's a deposit and it falls under the deposit insurance, so it's free of default. Yes and no. Problem, of course, is if your interest rate is linked to the performance of a stock index and the, stocks, the stock index went down during the crisis, one could say, well, yes, your, your deposit is safe, but don't expect to get any interest on that. because. In this particular product, obviously, your interest rate is linked to a uh, stock index and you will probably walk out of this investment with a zero interest. No. But still, uh, even though the names let you think that this is more of a risky investment, it's still a savings deposit. Okay. Payment transactions. We have cash, book money, monetary surrogates, or money substitutes. Um, payment transactions take place directly between the involved parties through payment transaction companies or through banks. And banks bear the risk of not being able to fulfill all payment wishes. We've already talked about the importance of banks for enabling financial transactions in, a, uh, in, a, in an economy. And I would say that a couple of years ago, um, when I started working on this script and on this lecture, I would have said, don't care about transactions. You can, you can offer bank accounts, you should charge some fees for your bank accounts, uh, and you, could, you should try to cross-sell your products, but this is not an area where a bank um, can have a unique selling proposition or where a bank can generate huge profits. Nowadays, this has changed a little bit because nowadays uh, with payment transactions being offered by PayPal, Amazon Pay, uh, Google and Amazon, um, this is something that is becoming more and more important. And one has to say, this is something that is um, going to uh, force banks to innovate uh, much more in the future because Amazon, Apple Pay, etc., PayPal, uh, they are much, um, they're quick learners when it comes to offering payment services. Mm -hmm. Now, we have different means of payment, or used to have, but you can um, differentiate cash, book money, electronic money, and money surrogates. For example, bills of exchange, Wechsel, checks, etc. And e-money, this is 
I don't want to go into the detail of discussing the fine print of electronic money. Under German law, electronic, electronic money, e-geld, is money that has been transferred to uh, a chip card and can be used without, for example, a PIN number. Um, if you, I don't have my card with me. Um, if I go to a store and if I pay with my uh, bank card, what is actually happening behind this transaction is that I am authorizing the m company to make a withdrawal from my checkings account, from my bank account. And they will have a small um, reader um, that will either uh, ask for my PIN or they will ask for my signature. But this is not really electronic money. It, I am simply using my contact details and my bank account details that is stored on my card to enable the shop to make a withdrawal just like a rent payment from my bank account. Electronic money is something different. In Germany, e-geld, electronic money, is a prepaid payment uh, in, to a ship card. Now, obviously, this has to change and one has to see where, for example, the cryptocurrencies, if they are ever um, regulated uh, and if they are ever accepted in Germany, cryptocurrencies and other types of electronic money where these will fit in here. But um, speaking from, from the perspective of German law, electronic money is something very narrow, narrowly defined. It's just e-guild. Yeah? Okay. Um, and we have cash and we have book money. Okay. What are the differences? Cash-based payment implies an obligatory acceptance of the payee. Uh, that is one of the nice features of cash. Usually in a country, each store and everyone is forced to accept it. Yeah. Cash is exposed to loss risk due to theft, storage and security costs and zero interest. But what is one famous or rather infamous advantage of cash? It's perfect for illegal uses. It's perfect for money laundering and for, or rather, you need money laundering um, and it's perfect uh, for illegal hiring people, for uh, paying workers without uh, having to pay into the social security systems. So cash is usually the preferred type of payment for all illegal uses. Yeah? That is also clear. Yeah? Book money is a claim against credit institutions with the right to cash at any time. You have a risk of a bank run because the bank must immediately comply with the claim for payment. Um, but book money obviously is not exposed, for example, usually not exposed to theft, for example. And payment transactions are all payment processes. That is, these are all transfers of all means of payment. and. Nowadays, we expect payments to be fast, secure, and inexpensive. This sounds natural to us and intuitive to us. But if you, I think I've given this example back in, in, in my school days and back in my childhood. I still remember that each and every uh, businessman uh, had two bank accounts, one with a Sparkasse and one with a Volksbank, one with a Savings and Loan Association and one with, the, uh, with the, um, a cooperative bank, a mutual bank. And why? Because banks charged fees for every transaction. And fees were lower if you transferred money from a Savings and Loan Association to another Savings and Loan Association or from a cooperative to another cooperative bank. And back, at the, back in these days, transactions took a couple of days to be processed. And it took longer if you transferred money from one pillar of the banking system to another pillar, from a cooperative to a savings and loan association. Nowadays, with the digitalized processes, obviously, this is no longer a problem. But you can still see this if you try to wire money, uh, say, for example, to Japan, to the US, to Canada, it still needs some time. And this is obviously something which 
uh, fintechs are much better at. PayPal doesn't need five days to transfer money from country A to country B. However, it's not that perfect also. Uh, has every, any one of you ever tried to wire money via PayPal? Have you tried that? I use cash for Okay. Um, I have to admit that I was only used to using, I don't want to make any, uh, I don't want to do too much advertising for PayPal here, but I have to explain it with the example of PayPal because I think it's the most, uh, it's the largest payment uh, service company uh, when it comes to purely uh, electronic companies and tech companies. Um, I used to think that PayPal was only good to use in online shops that you have a PayPal account, you go to an online shop, and instead of using your credit card, you simply use your PayPal account. However, uh, last year, uh, I had to transfer um, 2,000 euros um, to someone in the USA, and he simply, and the f first thing I found quite interesting was that he said, I don't have a bank account, I only have a PayPal account. I don't have a bank account, it's too pricey, uh, simply send me the money via PayPal. And what he did is he sent me a link to PayPal. And the link had all the information in it. I simply had to click on the link. Uh, I was transferred to my PayPal account and I, I authorized the payment uh, simply by logging into my PayPal account. Very convenient. Uh, if you were to do this with a German Sparkasse, you would pay, I would say, at least 20, 30 euros in fees. And you would have to discuss this with three persons in two branches over too much time. Yeah? Very inconvenient. But it's not too perfect. Why? I have a, obviously, I have a German PayPal account, but I was in the US at the time. And PayPal saw that I was accessing my PayPal account from the US, although I uh, have residence in Germany. So my PayPal account was uh, uh, closed for two days and I had to call PayPal and I had to reopen my PayPal account for security reasons. And then at the end, I was able to make the transfer. So, I mean, security was okay, but just if you have a different IP address, suddenly PayPal is not as convenient as it is supposed to be. So some, some things still don't work here. I'm not talking about using Bitcoin, but this is just old-fashioned PayPal. We have direct transactions. We have transactions between the parties involved, and these include payment processing companies that bundle individual cases, and sometimes we have direct transactions between banks. Um, and for direct transactions, uh, the criteria are, are well met if involved parties are at the same place and amounts are small. For example, if you shop in a supermarket, it's also the preferred option when sums of money are related to criminal offenses. I told you that tax evasion, drug trafficking, black market, as there is no documentation required. But at, then uh, if you have uh, money coming in from illegal sources. I don't want to um, give you any hints here, but it's quite clear that in this point you need money laundering. And money laundering means what? It means turning cash from illegal sources into money that can be used officially uh, and that you can spend officially. And there are some urban, I would say some urban legends which types of shops uh, are most prone to be uh, used for money laundering. Restaurants, actually laundry shops, uh, nail salons, those are the ones uh, where mon money laundering usually take place. Why? Um, because you have a, a lot, in a, in a regular restaurant, you have a lot of transactions. Uh, officials cannot supervise the number and all the amounts of all transactions. So it's quite easy to slip in, to uh, slip some money into the cash register and to blow up your business. And suddenly the cash uh, is generated as 
official revenues of your restaurant. And this is why many money laundering activities take place in restaurants, nail salons, beauty salons, and laundry shops, actually. What then happens is, uh, in Germany, we have the Money Laundering Act of 93, the Geldwäsche Gesetz, and it states that every time the banks see um, a cash transaction, a cash payment of more than 15,000 euros, they have to report it to authorities. And this helps to decrease money laundering, but obviously it, is, it can still be done in, in special shops that are set up to do money laundering. And by the way, this is also why our German, um, it's the German Zoll uh, that is responsible for uh, uh, anti-money laundering and Zoll uh, together with the uh, tax authorities is the German um, uh, Customs Agency. It's responsible for fighting uh, money laundering uh, together with the tax uh, authorities. Uh, they will regularly check uh, restaurants, shops where they fear that money laundering can take place and then they will ask for uh, proper accounting. Uh, and if they feel that they they do not have proper accounting and proper books, then they might be charged with money laundering. Payment processing companies. Um, these bundle payment transactions for many customers, uh, they have a possibility to realize econ economies of scale and they will transfer, or they will decrease the physical protection costs and the transport costs for the means of payment. And I would guess that some of these payment processing companies will increase in importance uh, because they can offer digital uh, processes and products for banks. And I guess some of these companies will disappear because, I mean, we'll probably see a lot of consolidation in the area of uh, payment processing. Now, banks. Um, when banking started um, to uh, process payments and transactions from one bank to another, um, the first cashless payment transaction was done in the 17th century at Hamburg Girobank. Uh, and their payments were done via an account transfer within the bank. This is obviously quite simple. If you keep books and if you keep accounts, you can transfer money from one account to another account. Uh, and this is still very simple and it uh, dates back to the 17th century. This is a gyro transfer, a gyro transfer. It's a payment transfer from one bank account to another bank account instigated by the payer and not the payee. So I, as the payer, instigate uh, this payment. Um, the system to uh, process transfers from one bank to another bank was established by the gyrement of supra-regional transfers uh, by the German Reichsbank at 1817-6. So shortly after um, the unification of Germany and the uh, formation of the German Empire, the Reichsbank installed the system to transfer or to, to process transfers from one bank to another. We had the introduction of the postal check in 1909 because in Germany we you, you might have seen a German bank called Postbank uh, and uh, for decades um, we've had a system uh, in which the German postal agency also uh, operated as a bank and up until privatization in the 90s uh, the German post uh, the postal agency was a state agency was called uh, Deutsche Bundespost German federal postal agency and it operated as a bank as well so you could open a checkings account and a deposit uh, account with the German postal agency and this is why here for example you can see that um, even at the beginning of the 20th century, um, the German postal agency also operated as a bank. Now, nowadays, you have the Gironetz der Deutschen Bundesbank, uh, the account system of the German Bundesbank, 
um, which states that every German bank must maintain an account with the Bundesbank and it must comply with the minimum reserve requirements as stated by uh, the statute of the European System of Central Banks, Article 19. Uh, the large banks have their own networks uh, and if customers of payers and recipients do not belong to the same gyro transfer system and network, payments must be processed via the Bundesbank network. Meaning that if you take an account uh, at Deutsche Bank and you make a transfer to another account with Deutsche Bank, it can be done within Deutsche Bank's network. But if you want to make a payment from, say, Commerzbank to a German Sparkasse, Leipziger Sparkasse, for example, uh, Sparkasse Leipzig, uh, then it needs to be done via the Bundesbank network. So the Bundesbank is at the central of this transfer system. Now, this, I would say this slide is already updated as we speak, and if I were to rewrite it, it would again be outdated. Um, transaction technology has undergone huge improvements over the last couple of uh, years and decades. Um, banks used to operate huge uh, systems uh, with magnetic stripes and magnetic databases and mag magnetic uh, floppy disks to save all their transactions and all payments. They had them on microfish uh, and uh, they at some point uh, they got document reading systems and documentless data medium exchange procedures uh, and then of course they installed automatic teller machines and so on and so on. Nowadays if I want to make a transfer with my bank I simply take my smartphone, I take a picture of the bill I need to pay and the algorithm in the app will extract all the information and it will automatically fill out the payment uh, template and I only have to use my thumb uh, to authorize the payment and then uh, the payment is done. And as you can see here, the technology uh, has uh, undergone huge improvements. Now, uh, we've also seen a harmonization uh, in bank codes and uh, nowadays, I guess what is most important is the uh, single euro payments area, which is uh, which was supposed to be a huge improvement. It is from a technical view, um, meaning that nowadays uh, we have uh, an IBAN, an international bank account number. Uh, we're starting, for example, in Germany with DE for German uh, bank accounts. You have a huge, I think, 16 digit uh, uh, IBAN number. IBAN number. Uh, IBAN number and um, in, in Germany it is for example DE then you have two, uh, two numbers that specify the sector and the network in my case for example it's 62 then in Germany we used to have uh, what was called a Bankleitzahl an ident a unique identifier for each bank and a, an account number, the conto number. Uh, and for example, in my case, uh, it's 4435, and then six additional digits. And this actually is the former Bankleitzahl, the unique identifier for the bank within Germany. This is the identifier for the country and the network, and this is the account number. Um, it took me a couple of months to memorize this number. So from a technical view, this is quite convenient because we, have, we now have unified, standardized uh, account numbers uh, within the euro system. But this is not very consumer friendly, right? Okay. And 
Yeah, some special features of cross-border payment transactions. Um, Trans-border, uh, cross-border transactions uh, um, generate more costs. Uh, banks will um, charge higher fees for this. You have to keep in mind that you will have to transfer your money uh, transfers from one currency to another currency. And some banks might be able to do it within their conglomerate, within their banking group. For example, Deutsche Bank also operates offices in Japan, in the US and in many other countries. Um, and yeah, there are obviously also uh, specialized companies like Western Union who offer specialized money transfer and money wire uh, transfers. Um, some special features of traditional banks. They have deposits and credit transactions. Um, they are in direct competition to providers who use invested money on the asset side. And traditional banks need to increase fees, because, um, and this will, of course, cause uh, a migration of customers. And as I've said earlier, uh, nowadays in Germany, banks can no longer offer bank accounts for free, but they need to charge fees on their banking services. And the advantage of a traditional bank is that a transfer between a low interest payment transaction account and a higher interest deposit account within a bank is only marginally costly. Usually, they will not charge you a huge fee. Yeah. Can you explain the second point? Um, um, how do you provide? I think this is not a good uh, translation. Providers. Um, I have, I have to look that up on my German slides. I don't know what providers was meant to be. No, I have to look that up. You can do this after the lecture because I, I would have to switch to the German uh, set of slides. And last but not least, some cards as a method of payments. Uh, we have money cards, we have debit cards, we have credit cards, and also some stores are trying to offer banking services via lower loyalty cards. From the Kaufhof, Karstadt, the large department stores, they also offer these loyalty cards. Um, and it's not really uh, a cash transfer, uh, but it's it's a very limited um, use, it has a very limited use as a payment uh, card. Okay. And you probably know all these different types. Um, and I, I don't want to go into too much detail uh, of the benefits and disadvantages of credit cards, loyalty cards, etc. You probably know all about this. Um, it's in, in Germany, at least in the banking system, um, credit cards are something that are still quite frequently used uh, for cross-selling because some banks will offer you a cash, um, they will offer you a, a free checkings account uh, with a, a free credit card uh, in order to attract customers and in order to be able to cross-sell other products. For example, Targo Bank here uh, for some time uh, they offered a free uh, master or visa card um, and almost all other banks charge uh, an annual fee for a credit card but some banks use credit cards to attract customers and it's just done for cross-selling. Okay. And I might have mentioned this. Uh, it is quite interesting to see that uh, payment habits are different from culture to culture. Uh, for example, uh, I was when I studied in Japan, uh, I was really surprised by the fact it has changed a lot since then. But in 2004, no one used credit cards in Japan. If you thought that Japan, being one of the most important and largest economies in the world, that in Japan everyone would accept a credit card, you were fatally mistaken. 
because in Japan, traditionally, everyone uses cash. And with Japan having a high level of security and public safety, uh, you don't need to worry about carrying too much cash on you. Everyone was just having a huge pile of cash with him or her at any time. And in shops and restaurants, you could not pay with a credit card. That has changed now. And nowadays, you even have shops in Japan where you can pay with Bitcoin. Um, and this is... Uh, very dependent on cultural habits. If people use cards more or less than, for example, cash. Okay. I have also mentioned the PSD2. Uh, this is the Payment Services Directive 2, uh, effective uh, uh, this year, became effective this year. And its goal is to increase competition between banks and non-banks to strengthen data security in online payment transactions and harmonize the customer rights and responsibilities of payment service companies. And the main change is that it brings an obligation for banks to create an interface for customer data exchange with external payment service companies, aka fintechs. That is, if I'm a customer with a German bank and you are a small company that asks me, are you willing to give me your details um, of, on, of your bank account and especially your transaction details? And if I say yes, the bank is forced, legally obliged and forced to offer an interface via which you as a company, as a very small company, can access your customer's data. The customer has to agree to this, obviously, but before that, the bank could always say, we don't have an interface. We would love to give you the data, but first of all, this is our data. We don't have to give you the data and we don't have an interface, case closed. But the PSD2 forces banks to offer interfaces to transfer the customer's transaction data to any company that is interested in this data and has been authorized by the customer to access the data. And why is this a huge change? Well, it enables every company, but most importantly fintech companies, to analyze huge amounts of data that before the PSD2 only banks had. Only banks had this type of data and only banks were able to analyze this data. And now if, for example, you are an insurance, let's assume you uh, have a business and you want to sell shoes. And if your customers agree to giving access to their bank data at any bank, and you can show this to any bank, you as a shoe company can access all the data, all the transaction data from all banks of your customers. And you can see on which days did my customers buy their shoes and which competitors. And you can try to market, uh, and to, you can try to use this data in marketing and um, in your business. And this is obviously, this is a very hypothetical example, but this is obviously what fintechs are dreaming of, that they are able to access all the data on account transactions at banks and then profile their customers. And this is what actually Amazon is doing, has been doing for years, and Google, etc. Yeah? Just they did not have the exact full access to bank detail and bank data, they were just able to analyze the data people left at Amazon on the internet shop. Okay, this is PSD2. Big change for banks, but also insurance companies. They have the same problem. Okay. Then, next, uh, we would talk about the credit business. Uh, because I need to run to uh, an uh, extraordinary uh, lecture uh, in my introduction to business. I need to run to the other lecture hall now. Uh, do you have any questions? Because I don't think it makes too much sense to start now with lending. Um, as you can see, we'll talk about lending next. And then in 4.2, we'll shortly discuss investment banking.
Investment banking, uh, I have uh, a full lecture on investment banking in our master's degree. That's a lecture that will be uh, held next semester in the summer term. And I have to say that I will not be giving that lecture, but uh, a good friend of mine who is an investment banker with Deutsche Bank, and he's much more versed to talk about investment banking than I am. So if you're interested in investment banking, uh, you might want to take that class next, next semester. But we'll continue with lending and credit business. And as you can see, I would urge you to also look at the German slides, because this is, this is something that is it was horrible to translate from the German sets, uh, set of slides to the English set of slides. Why? Because all these different types of loans, they are based on German law. Uh, and in some cases, it makes sense to translate the words. In some other cases, it doesn't make sense. For example, Geld leihe, Kredit leihe can be translated into money lending and credit lending, but it doesn't give full credit uh, to the actual sense of the word. Geldleihe means that you are offering cash to someone else. Kreditleihe means you're extending credit to someone else, meaning that you will not give out money, but with a Kreditleihe, you are promising to settle a debt in case uh, it materializes. So uh, a traditional loan is a Geldleihe. It's a case of Geldleihe under German law. Kreditleihe is something different. And you might want to ha have a look at uh, the German slides. Uh, I'm not 100% sure that all the English translations uh, are self-explanatory. No? But uh, the, German, the German text should be fine, uh, because that is really based on, on German civil code. Again, here you can also see that, uh, for example, um, we have all different types of uh, collaterals. Uh, Bürgschaft, gewöhnliche Bürgschaft is an ordinary uh, surety. Uh, selbst schuldnerische Bürgschaft, uh, that's even, even for German standards, that's a horrible word. Uh, and it can be translated in a, a directly enforceable guarantee or guarantee. Uh, and this is very peculiar to German law. So please have a look at the German slides as well. And if you have no questions, we'll stop here. And I'll see you on Thursday, because we have one extra, uh, extra lecture on Thursday to make up for the one uh, that was postponed, I think, two weeks ago. Yeah. Okay. Then see you Thursday.